Hello and welcome to the 2024 Rugby League season. Uh, it's going to be a very big year. We've got a vast array of events throughout the course of the season. We're just about to get underway with the All-Stars and the pre-season competition. And before we know it, we'll be into Round 1 in Vegas and the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the Telstra Premiership. Uh, we've got Magic Round, we've got State of Origin, uh, we've got the NRLW Premiership starting a little later in the season and of course the final series and then an international series to finish us off. But that's a long way down the track. Uh, there's a lot of great football and a lot of great events to take place between now and then. The purpose of this presentation today is to take you through uh, some of the uh, tweaks and adjustments that we're making to what happens on the field in 2024 uh, based on a review of what took place last year. And uh, you know, thankfully there's uh, only one rule change. We've got a lot of feedback from a lot of people, but the overriding theme was uh, don't change the rules too much, don't tinker with the rules. So there's only one rule change, which we'll go through in a moment. Uh, but there are a number of other uh, practices that have taken place and have developed over the last 12 months or so that we uh, need to bring back a little uh, to try and keep the game as open and flowing as possible. Uh, so we'll do that. But I just wanted to start by uh, just reinforcing that this has been our focus, uh, the, the overriding focus of uh, what we've tried to do over recent years. And it comes back to that whole theme of uh, as entertaining, engaging, as open and free flowing, reducing stoppages as much as possible. So our focus is going to remain on the play the ball speed, uh, the 10 metre compliance. Uh, and again, that if we can get fast play the balls, if we can get a 10 metres, uh, com 10 metre compliance as much as possible, uh, then that opens up opportunities for teams uh, to attack and uh, make the game as free flowing as possible. Uh, now, also of course, referees will continue to focus on how they achieve that. We a few years ago we introduced the six again rather than penalising, so they'll continue to maintain that high standard of compliance by using the six again and penalising depending on field position where offences take place. Um, and of course the last point on this slide is that uh, the referees in the match review committee will continue to focus and take a strong stand against foul play. Uh, that's a player safety issue, uh, but it's also about giving the players the freedom to play the game without having to worry about foul play. So uh, they are the things that underpin everything we do in the game and will continue to underpin everything we do in the game in the 2024 season. So I'll move straight on to the, uh, the one rule change that I talked about. And uh, this uh, involves uh, restarts with kicks. Uh, you may have read something about this uh, not so long ago, but this is the one rule that the Commission have signed off on. Uh, and again, it's, in, it's intended to try and incentivise more uh, competition for the ball from restarts, whether it be a goal line dropout uh, or a restart from the halfway line. It's intended to uh, make sure that teams have an opportunity to compete for the ball. Uh, there are not that many competitions for the ball in our game now because there doesn't need to be with the with six tackles of course the game the ball changes hands every 45 to 60 seconds but introducing a new competition uh, for possession or incentivizing another competition for possession is something that uh, we've seen happen naturally over the last season, in particular with goal line dropouts. We're seeing more and more short restarts where teams are contesting the ball uh, rather than kicking deep uh, to the defence and allowing them to take possession and uh, go back on the attack. So what this rule is intended to do is to make the penalty for that if it goes wrong uh, less of an impact uh, to encourage it to happen more often be it from goal line dropouts or be it from kicks from the centre of the halfway line. So let's just have a look at how it will work. Uh, kicks, if you'll see on the second line, the green, the green line here is the very important uh, part of this. The kicks must be capable of being contested in the opinion of the referee. So all existing rules apply to kicks that are not uh, contestable. So if a team decides to kick deep, and of course they have that option, uh, they're not compelled to take these short uh, restarts, they can still kick deep if that's uh, the way they would like to approach a restart. Uh, but 
if they do decide to kick uh, for a contestable restart, that's a decision that the referee will make based on the type of kick and the circumstances where the ball comes down, whether there are players in a position to contest the ball or not. Now, if uh, a team does decide to do that, going back to the top point, and the ball goes over the touch line on the full or fails to travel at least 10 metres forward, which is, uh, they're the requirements under the international laws of the game, instead of a team conceding a penalty, which is a, a, a big risk, uh, depending on what's happening in a game at any particular time, play will restart with a play the ball 10 metres from where the ball was kicked, 10 metres further downfield, so either 10 metres from the goal line or 10 metres from the halfway line, and 10 metres in from touch. There, all other rules uh, still apply, so if a player from either team prevents the ball from going 10 metres, um, either the kicking team come out and, and touch the ball before it goes 10 metres, or a player from the receiving team comes inside the 10 metres and, to prevent the ball from travelling 10 metres, that's still a penalty. Uh, so the, this rule change only really applies to the kick uh, and where it comes down if it fails to go 10 metres of its own accord uh, or goes into touch on the full. And the final point about the, the new rule is uh, if the half-time or full-time siren sounds uh, prior to the play the ball taking place, uh, time will be extended so that that play the ball can still happen, just as it would have under the previous rule if it had been a penalty, uh, time would have been extended to allow the penalty to take place. So that's the basics of the rule. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of examples here that uh, obviously this rule wasn't in place last year but these are the types of kicks that we're talking about. Now in this first example, and I'm not going to refer to teams or players in uh, these particular examples because uh, it's not about what happened last year, it's about what's going to happen in 2024. So um, th this, this should not be seen as any indication about teams that, in any of these clips, not so much in these ones, but in the, cl in the clips we're going to look at later, should not be seen as an indication of any particular players or teams uh, that do this because these things happen right across the competition. But in relation to restarts, most of us when we think about restarts, we think about those cross field, high cross field kicks from a line dropout or occasionally we'll see that, uh, well less often we'll see it from a, uh, a restart from the halfway line. This one's a little bit unusual because it's not a high kick, uh, but it's certainly a kick that is capable of being contested. It bounces uh, towards the uh, touch line and you'll see that there are players from the kicking team that are coming out to try and contest the ball. We'll let it run. Now it's bouncing there, you can see, and goes over the touch line, short of the 10 metre line. Just go back and have a uh, a look a little bit slower so you can see it as it happens. The kick, it's cross field, it's bounce, bounces in the, uh, within the 10 metre line, uh, players coming out, waiting for it to go 10 metres so they can uh, try and regain the ball. The ball bounces up in the air and over the touch line. So in, in this particular case, uh, what will happen is we would come back for a play of the ball to the receiving team in that position, 10 metres out from the goal line and 10 metres in from touch. The next example is, again, this is, a, uh, this is one that is from a, from a restart from the halfway. We see these um, pretty regularly when teams are uh, behind and late in the game and they need to get the possession back. We'll watch this one goes through. I'll take it through in slow motion. It's a high kick across field. So we've got players from both teams in the area where the ball's coming down, both able to contest it if it travels 10 metres. In this case, it lands just short of the 10 metre line. Neither, players from neither team have uh, prevented it from going 10 metres, so that's okay. The ball's still bouncing and it bounces into touch short of the 10 metre line. So it hasn't gone the required distance and again, we would restart 10 metres from the halfway line on the 40 metre line and 10 metres in from touch with a play the ball to the receiving team. So this uh, removes the disincentive for kicking teams to take the risk of conceding a penalty. And uh, that's pretty much the basis of this rule change. I want to move on to uh, some of these issues that I mentioned have become more pre prevalent over the last season, particularly 
these were things that we noticed during the course of the year and they are things that we could not address during the season because it would change the approach that we were taking mid-season. Uh, and this one relates particularly to downtown chasers. Now, the original intention of the downtown rule, downtown rule's been in place for a long time. But over a period of time, it has morphed into a scenario where players are staying behind the ruck until the ball's played, but they, as soon as the ball's played, they're taking off downfield, uh, encircling the receiver, and the receiver's got nowhere to go at all. Uh, so it's a, it's a negative play that, uh, that is intended to slow the play down as a player receives the ball, not give him anywhere to go. But the original intention was that uh, it prevented that from happening. Now we've got an example here that I want to show you. Uh, well, we should probably review what the rule is first. Uh, in general, player for player is in front of the kicker and intentionally advances beyond the point of the previous play the ball before the ball has gone past the chasers. Now, that's the important part of this, uh, of this change. A penalty will be awarded at the mark of the play the ball. So let's have a look at what that means in effect. Uh, we'll let this vision go. We'll see what happens here. Here comes the kick. You can see there are players in front of the kicker. But let's go back and look at exactly what we're talking about. Uh, now, I ask you to take note of where the play the ball takes place. You can see on the Kia vehicle on the field here, that we're just on the left-hand side of the uh, windscreen. So that's the position of the play the ball. So we can reference that in just a moment. And as, as I, um, you can see that we've got players here and here uh, who are very close to the play of the ball, but that's okay, they're entitled to be there. But let's just watch what happens with them and other players from the kicking team as we move forward. Ball's played, goes back to the kicker, and we'll stop it when the ball hits the boot. About there. So if you remember, this is where the ball was played, but we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, nine players who have all advanced beyond the point of that play the ball before the ball has kicked. So they don't have to be behind the kicker, they just have to stay behind the point where the ball was played. And uh, the referees will be monitoring this and that will result in a penalty if that happens throughout the, uh, throughout the 2024 Premiership. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that's not confined to this one example. Uh, this has happened, happens across all clubs right throughout uh, the course of last season. OK, let's move on to the next point. Uh, obstruction at the ruck and in the defensive line. Now again, this is something that uh, has got progressively worse over time and one where we, uh, we need to enforce the existing rule. And a penalty may be awarded if a player takes up a position near the play of the ball and in the opinion of the referee, obstructs a, def a defender regardless of whether there is physical contact. So uh, there's another example that I'll show you in a moment which goes to the second point. In general play, if a player stands in the defensive line or is in front of the play of the ball and in the opinion of the referee obstructs a defender regardless of whether there is physical contact. So let's have a look at uh, some examples. And uh, I'll go again slowly with these but we'll, we'll stop it at the important point here. We'll, we'll go back um, just to the play, the play the ball. So you can see the player with the ball's getting up and you can see that two players have uh, arrived right beside the ruck. Uh, that's from the team in possession. So you've got, uh, as we go to the wide shot, you can see we've got a player here and a player here who have moved to a position directly adjacent to the ruck. Now, there are two markers and of course the referee has to ensure that the markers remain square. That's uh, part of the referee's job in every, in every ruck. But these players uh, stand in that position and then we'll see what happens when we advance the, the footage further. The ball gets played and the players who are chasing the markers, you can see they get one goes either side. Um, the, the player that's coming this side, uh, he has to run around those two players. Now that in itself uh, creates an obstruction to a player who's not in possession of the ball. Now there, are no, there is no uh, requirement for these players to stand in any particular position. They don't have to be a certain uh, number of metres behind the ruck, but 
Uh, there is also a rule that talks about uh, obstruct, deliberately obstructing another player who's not in possession of the ball. So in this scenario, if players are forming that kind of uh, blocking action uh, the, and play, and the referee believes that the uh, the referee believes that that player who's chasing has been obstructed, the the referee can award a penalty for it. Uh, now we'll go to a another example. Okay, in this particular example, again there are two players that have moved to that position, but you'll notice there's a bit of a gap between these two players. Uh, that doesn't make any difference if the referee again believes that these players have created an obstruction. So we'll let the footage run on here. And you can see again that chaser who's coming um, towards the number eight, he has to actually jink around number eight to chase the ball. So again, the referee can determine that that's an obstruction. Um, and if it goes to the bunker, the bunker can determine that that's an obstruction and uh, can penalise for that. So uh, it's a case-by-case -case scenario. Uh, there may be occasions where players are in that vicinity but there's no obstruction created. And it might be the chasers go uh, a different direction or they don't even chase. Uh, but if the referee uh, forms the view that there is an obstruction uh, that has impacted on a defending player, then a penalty can be awarded. Now, the, uh, the second point that was on that previous slide is a different type of obstruction. And uh, we'll have a look at this particular incident. I might let this run uh, in normal speed first. So you can see the play the ball straight through the defensive line, makes a long break. A lot of uh, ground is gained in this particular run. But let's go back and see what happens. Now, this will more often than not happen from a kick and uh, so uh, the receiving team get the ball and the players from his own team are very slow coming back. And what they do in some cases is they get themselves in the middle of the defensive line. Now you can see one, two, three players who are in the defensive line uh, and creating a lot of obstruction in that defensive line and it's between those players, if I let the play go on, that the break is made straight through because of the interference that was created by the uh, players from the team in possession who were standing in the defensive line. So two types of interference in the ruck. The first one is uh, where the players take up a position immediately beside the ruck. And the one we've just looked at is where uh, players who are coming back on side stand in the defensive line and create an obstruction. And in each of these cases, the referees can determine that that is worthy of a penalty. Leg lifting is another thing that has become uh, more regular in the, uh, in the game. It can be a player safety issue. Uh, we'll show some examples. but. A penalty or a set restart, depending on field position, will be awarded if the player in possession is held by one or more defenders and a further defender lifts the leg of the ball carrier in a manner considered by the referee to be potentially dangerous. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. In this first one, a couple of players hold, another player comes, lifts the leg, spins the ball carrier around. Second example, then we'll go back and look at them both. Again, a couple of defenders up top, another player grabs the leg, spins around. Another quick look in both cases. Two players up top. Now it doesn't have to be two players, it can be two, three, it can even be one if a second player comes in. Grabs the leg, lifts. Now this immediately puts the player in possession off balance and you can see uh, he reaches for the ground here because he knows that he's, uh, he's lost his balance. Uh, and it can go wrong, it can turn into a dangerous throw if, uh, if the player's mo momentum carries him forward and he goes head first towards the ground. Uh, but in this particular case, as the player lifts the leg, he moves it around, twisting the player. Now you can see he's pivoting on the leg on the ground and one hand on the ground. 
and uh, you can imagine the potential consequences in terms of knees and ankles uh, from this sort of action. So that's that one. Second one, again, a couple of players up top, grab the leg, lift it and carry it sideways. Again, he's on one leg. He's uh, trying to hop to stop his leg from being planted on the ground as he's spun around and ultimately taken to ground. Now, you know, again, I say to you that um, this is not about these clubs or these players because we see examples of this every week in the Telstra Premiership and it's something from a player safety perspective that uh, we don't want to see in the game. Lending weight. Now, this has become uh, much more apparent uh, in 2023 than we've seen in previous seasons, but a player may lend weight to a teammate in possession to avoid him being pushed backwards, losing ground. But a player cannot lend weight to gain momentum or impede a defender from making a tackle. If this occurs, the referee will immediately call held and deem the tackle complete. And if a player lending weight to one of his own teammates uh, assists in the scoring of a try, a penalty will be awarded. So in the case of it's further downfield, the referee will call held and there'll be a play the ball. Uh, but if it actually results in a try, then the player will, uh, will be penalised. But let's have a look at uh, some examples of this. And uh, I think this quite graphically demonstrates it. You'll see that uh, as the player in possession reaches the defence, another player from his own team comes up behind him and starts uh, pushing him forward. In this case, two players from the same team. But again, if you just look at that one, how much additional ground is gained. So there's the initial contact from the defence. And he's pretty much stopped at that point. And then in come teammates. And you can see how they, he's being pushed forward and how much additional uh, ground is gained as a result of that. Let's go to the second example. And again, you can see that there's almost 20 metres of additional ground gained as a result of the additional weight. So there it is, pushing forward. And the other reason why this is a, uh, problematic in the game is that by that player uh, being in contact with his own player to push him forward, it actually reduces the target zone for other defenders. So if another player was trying to come in and help with this tackle, having that additional attacking player in the ruck actually reduces the opportunity for defenders. And that's why it's a successful ploy, but one that uh, is certainly not in the spirit of the game and, and one that is not within the rules. We go to uh, interfering with defenders, which is kind of the complete opposite to what we've just looked at. And uh, again, we see more and more players uh, coming to pull tacklers off uh, in order to try and get a quicker, the quicker play the ball. And players from the team in possession cannot interfere with tacklers or attempt to push or drag tacklers off the tackle player. That's the role of the referee. If the referee believes that a defender is taking too long to get off a player in possession, then that's why he has a whistle and that's why he has the ability to award penalties. It's certainly not open to players uh, teammates to come in and start removing defenders so they can get a faster play of the ball. Just got the one example on this. Um, uh, again, you, we see it regularly in games across uh, the season, uh, but I think one example will give you an idea of what we're talking about. See the tackle there, and uh, another player comes and starts dragging tacklers off, and you can see how quickly the ball gets played as a result of that. So. Again, we'll just go to slow motion. So there's two defenders in there, or three defenders in there making a tackle, and a player from the team in possession grabs hold of a defender and starts dragging him off. And you can see how quickly that releases the player in possession, allow, enabling him to play the ball quickly. So uh, that's, uh, again, something that uh, we need to ensure uh, we don't see happening on a regular basis in our game. 
Uh, kick disruptors is a little more obscure in that it's difficult to pick up sometimes. Uh, but if in the opinion of the referee or the bunker, a player uh, feigns or pretends to compete for the ball uh, from a kick and interferes with the catcher, uh, this may be considered obstruction and penalised. So again, it's a case-by-case -case scenario. Uh, I just want to show you this one example, and there may be differing opinions on this, but uh, no two situations are going to be the same, and it's a decision that the referee will have to make. But in this particular case, uh, it's, a, it's a contest for the ball, or it looks like it's going to be a contest for the ball, but you'll see the uh, player from the kicker's team jumps uh, early and comes down and lands before the ball arrives and that actually has an impact on the receiver and we'll let it go through. So jumps, lands, then the ball arrives and as a result he makes contact with the receiver. Now the receiver in this case lands very awkwardly. Um, I'm not suggesting for a moment that that was the intent to make the, uh, the player land awkwardly but uh, he could have dropped the ball as a result of that. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an attempt to uh, have an impact on the ability of the receiver to take the ball cleanly. Now, some people might argue, well, you know, he's got eyes for the ball, he's, he's attempting to compete for the ball, and these are the decisions that the referees have to make on all sorts of incidents right throughout the course of our game. Uh, but they have to look at this and determine whether this was a genuine attempt to compete for the ball or whether it was an, an attempt to interfere with the receiver. So uh, again, it's something that uh, will no doubt cause some controversy throughout the year, but we have to make sure that players are genuinely competing for the ball if there's to be any contact between them. Uh, the surrender tackle is something that uh, came up um, throughout the course of the season on a less regular basis, but we saw uh, some of it where it, uh, it wasn't a good look for the game. Uh, it put pressure on referees. It kind of took the, the the role of the referee away from the referee in some in some way but a surrender tackle where the ball carrier succumbs in readiness to be tackled in other words a player remains on the ground because he believes that he's not going to make any further progress uh, he's not looking to take any advantage the referee will immediately call surrender to indicate the tackle's complete regardless of whether a defender has made contact and that'll be uh, that'll become clear when i show you the example if a player surrenders he can't then be lifted or dragged into touch or touch in goal. So I've only got the one example to show you here. And you can see as the ball is retrieved, the player falls to the ground and at that point uh, he is not attempting to get up, uh, he's not attempting to continue to run, he's close to the goal line so you know, he doesn't, clearly doesn't want to take the risk on being pushed back so he stays down. Now, the, player, the players who are in a position to tackle, they decide not to touch him because they're hoping that if he gets up and plays the ball without being touched that the referee will penalise him for uh, a voluntary tackle. But uh, this is the sort of thing that we've seen in our game for a long time where players, particularly when they're close to the goal line, will try and get the ball back into the field of play or keep the ball in the field of play. And we get to the situation which I'm about to show you where we get this Mexican standoff where the player on the ground thinks, well, uh, I need to do something and the player who's the marker in this case or um, the defender uh, is not prepared to touch him and this happens. So they stand off, he backs away, he keeps crawling, they're appealing to the referee for a penalty and it's just not a good look. Uh, what will happen uh, in 2024 is if that player decides to stay on the ground they're effectively conceding a tackle of their six, one of their six tackles anyway and uh, there'll be no reason for a defender not to place a hand on that player or to fall on that player uh, so that they can take uh, some additional time to get off the player given that it's a uh, surrender tackle they get a little bit more time to get off but we won't see this situation where we've got players refusing to touch another player and players crawling along the ground or deciding uh, what they should do given that they haven't yet been tackled. This is one where we're giving a little bit of latitude back to the players. Uh, there's only one example I'll show you of this. This is from a um, uh, what uh, has effectively in the past been called a, potentially a deliberate knock-on and the referees will, will apply a less strict interpretation of the deliberate knock-on unless it's deemed to be a blatant attempt to regain possession or, uh, or gain an advantage. What 
is a blatant attempt to regain possession or gain an advantage is, you know, in a, 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 an obvious case it might be a player who uh, throws the ball over the head of a defender, runs around and regathers it. You know, that would be a deliberate knock forward and, and would be a penalty. But in some of the examples we've seen in the past where the referees have considered taking that action, it's nothing more than a player just trying to regain possession and juggling the ball. So I'll show you um, this, this example. So this is from a restart. The ball goes deep. It bounces awkwardly up in the air very high. A player jumps up, tries to knock it back to a, one of his own teammates. And a player from the kicking side uh, gets there in time to, as you can see, it's in the air here, it's been knocked back by one of the receiving players and before it gets to his teammate, a player from the kicking side gets a hand to it, the ball bounces forward and then without any other player touching it, he regathers it uh, for a try. Now in the past that could have been uh, viewed to be a deliberate knock on, uh, but in our view it's uh, nothing more than a player uh, competing for the ball and juggling the ball in, in order to pull it in and that should be allowed to continue. Mid-air tackles, now this is something that created a bit of controversy last year. Uh, there was one particular incident where a player fielded a ball in mid-air but it wasn't uh, on the full, it was from a bouncing ball. So let's just review the rule firstly. A player attempting to field a kick on the full in mid-air cannot be tackled. That's no, that's no change, that's the same rule uh, that will be in place in 2024. A player attempting uh, to field a kick other than on the full, in other words a bouncing kick, can be tackled mid-air, that's unchanged as well, so the player can be tackled. However, the catcher must not be placed in a dangerous or vulnerable position, either intentionally or accidentally. So. Uh, in this particular case, which uh, many people will remember because it was quite high profile at the time, uh, let's have a look at what happened. So it kicks charged down, the ball bounces and bounces up in the air. Um, a player from the kicker's team attempts to regather it and one of the defenders makes contact with that player while he's in mid-air. So let's just look at this, this is quite a good angle. So the ball's kicked. It's charged down, it's directly into the ground, so it's gone from the charge down straight into the ground. So it's not a kick on the full, bounces in the air. Support player from the kicking team jumps high to retrieve it and uh, he is tackled whilst he's in mid-air. But he does land very awkwardly uh, with the potential for injury. So in that scenario, the, the different application that will apply uh, in 2024 is if the referee believes that that is a dangerous outcome, uh, they can award a penalty for that. It doesn't change the rule, just uh, extends the, uh, the ability for the referee to determine it as a dangerous tackle. So uh, that's it, that's the, um, that's the uh, our full uh, complement of issues that we wanted to run through today. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, just one change to the laws of the game. Uh, the others that we've been through are existing laws that uh, we feel we just need to tighten up on a little with the sole intent of uh, trying to keep the game as open and flowing as possible uh, without the rules being crept to a point where uh, it has the opposite effect. So some of these things that have taken place that we are trying to address uh, obviously are intended to try and gain an advantage and I'm not being critical of coaches for doing that. I mean coaches, their job is uh, to try and win football games and to the extent that the referees permit some of these things to happen, uh, then you know coaches are going to do that. But uh, referees have got a responsibility to try and make sure that the game does remain as open and free-flowing as possible and uh, these focuses that we will take into the 2024 Premiership should ensure that that happens. 
So uh, I hope uh, you have a, a great season of rugby league viewing, whichever team you support throughout the year. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic season. Can't wait for it to start. Only uh, a few more days and uh, we'll be uh, right back into the thick of it. So uh, all the best, whichever team you support for the year. I hope uh, it's good for you. And uh, we'll see you on a weekly basis as we review each round of the Telstra Premiership.